just like a mountain hike where every obstacle on the path forces a choice between retreating or finding another way. So too do organizations encounter these challenges and choices. And today we're going to explore transforming challenges into launch pads for an organization's success to help your career. Today, Amy is going to be sharing her insights on moving on from a software engineer to a leading data strategist who is incredibly well-known and respected. She's going to be offering advice for any data leader looking to make an impact and create success on this episode of Data Team Success, brought to you in partnership with our friends at Amplitude and me, Ross Webb. Coming up on today's episode, the secrets of data transformation success, the heart of data governance, honesty in discussing challenges at conferences, and the design and implementation of data products. Amy, I'm excited to discuss data governance and its impact on an organization. But first, I'd love to get your thoughts and experience on change management. Yeah, of course. I mean, one of the things that I noticed while I was working on the technical side of things, it's that there is usually, you know, this gap in between business people and technical people. And I had the opportunity to work also as a, a QA engineer on the software uh, side. And usually the QA person needs to act, act like this bridge most of the times between the developers and also, you know, product owners, managers, et cetera, that are not that tech savvy. So when I keep advancing on my career and when I got into data, I got more and more into business analysis, into data analysis, more of these topics. And I understood the lack of um, communication and engagement in between. Usually data teams get blamed about everything. And it's like, okay, it's your fault that we don't have the right metrics, the right numbers, et cetera. But most of the times we don't get what we need from the business side. So they are expecting us to do magic with just some words like, oh yeah, I want the leads metric or I want uh, this uh, HR metric, but I can I can figure out by myself how to calculate it. But maybe the way you want to calculate it is a little bit different. So, you know, there are discrepancies in between that you need to bring closer. So that's why I decided to move towards this uh, change management. And I actually did a master's degree in digital transformation for businesses just to have this uh, kind of focus, you know, and how to bring uh, companies more into um, in the digital space or into data, um, data-driven data companies, let's say it that way. So that's how I move there. It's quite difficult. It's quite painful. And you need to really be kind of a preacher, you know, with a book here. Hey, have you heard about data governance? Have you heard about data quality? And just knock doors. People will uh, shut down the doors in your face most of the time. But if you continue to build up these bridges and these uh, relationships, it works. But most of the people get discouraged in the first year, year and a half of this. And usually to get digital transformation or this kind of uh, uh, company transformation in general with data uh, or any other topics in tech, it, w- it will take more than three years. Most of the time it's five years. And that's what people don't, it's not really understanding, you know, that it needs patience and it needs time. And this is what I'm trying to do here, you know, most of the time to, to, to talk to people, to listen. It's not only talk, but it's more about listening both sides and bring together both sides on an agreement. Amy, that's amazing. What have you seen as the most positive way to progress this change? Yeah, I think it starts from the strategy per se. So before you build up this data strategy, you have to make sure that you are actually at, um, you know, matching these uh, new goals with the strategy of the company. And you need to find allies. So to build these relationships, what I have found the most um, effective, let's say, is, is uh, basically find people like the CFO because they are interested, for example, in cost reduction. And that's a big al- ally on the board that you can have and go and speak to him and maybe fund your idea of what you can do. So building a case for for that for that CFO or for the CPO or the COO, for example, for HR, some metrics, automation for the people from HR where they don't have an intern, you know, because we have the case at some point where we had an intern doing um, some kind of a report on Excel manually. And now we did for them um, all these automated dashboard 
for HR with all the metrics of, uh, you know, hiring time and interview information and, and attrition rates and all these kind of things. And it's saving time for them. They can u- utilize, again, this, um, this resource, this intern for something else, and they will have automatically this data coming from their systems every month, and they can check this information and present that easily. So this is, I think, these people that is not really like the CDO, the CTO, or even the CEO are good allies, but you need to sell the things a little bit um, different. But if you help the people that are currently having the issues right now, they are going to be more more uh, happy to sell your ideas because you really help them with something they are struggling for quite some time. And you teach them how they can improve their time and save money and save costs and save uh, resources. And then they will advocate that for you. And that's one of the things that I will say are more effective to start driving these uh, changes little by little. So how do you prioritize what is most important? For example, in terms of reach and impact. Yeah, I mean, um, we we do it depending on the business uh, goals. So depending on the KPIs that they have, we try to match whatever initiatives we have, and that's how we prioritize. Um, because you know, the, the more you are connected to the to the business, the easier it is to get the buy in, because that's one of the hardest part. When we started bottom up, and it was very painful, until we started to match it with whatever they had on top. Because we, we saw the needs, for example, from the bottom in infrastructure, in the equality, governance, this and this and that. But at the end, that was not the prior from the top. So once you start kind of matching whatever you had on the pipeline with the business goal, it's much easier. So that's the, the technique that I'm uh, use, using so far. Let's talk about data governance and its impact on organizational efficiency. Could you share your thoughts and experience on this? Yeah, um, like I told you, one of the examples that I gave you already, this monetization team, um, the fact that now most of the of the teams are, all the stakeholders are already to create metrics, for example, and they own it now. Uh, so they are the data owners of this. So they don't own, for example, the pipeline, but they own the definition, they own the calculation, they own if something changes they are responsible to communicate to the data team so they can do the changes necessary for other people to consume it so that's something so important with data governance because when you don't have an owner you don't have who to blame and then you blame just the data teams or the product team or whoever you find the product manager you should, the product manager also as well always have the fault so i think with data governance it's also difficult because you need also it's a lot about communication. It's a lot about listening and talking as well. And pretty much the same we just spoke. It's kind of rinse and repeat on digital transformation because um, data, for example, with the data mesh in my experience, we started building up this shiny data platform. People will come and have it there and use it in self-service analytics. But there, I, I got questions from other data teams because we have many data teams like, Why do I need this infrastructure? I already have mine. Why do I need to migrate? It makes no sense. Uh, We do it better than you, blah, 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 blah. So because we are the data platform team, right? So they were quite resistant in adopting these uh, topics or even, for example, hey, we have this uh, uh, data, new data catalog where you can actually uh, do discovery of the data or we have uh, this data ownership um, uh, framework that is coming soon so you can adopt it. And I found that I got a lot of resistance out of it and what it worked for other teams to be able to adopt this or to understand a bit was to, um, you know, okay, we will do it for our team because we are also central services. So we work for HR, for marketing, for other teams. And there are these four units who have their own different um, data teams, 15, 70 people each one. So it's quite a lot of data people in my company. And um, the thing is... um, to do it in our team and show them how it improved for us certain things brought some um, curiosity that they would like to try certain tools or certain ways uh, of working or the data owners and how they will split it. For example, we have business data owners, we have technical data owners, and we have people even from the products uh, from the product side 
um, on the on the backend side that owns uh, their own, um, you know, for example, APIs. So they can, you know, if there are some changes coming uh, upstream, we can really catch it before it breaks our pipelines with data contracts, for example, or uh, this kind of, of topics. So data governance is quite broad because it not only englobes, um, you know, processes, but it englobes infrastructure, it englobes data privacy, security. It involves also all the um, process improvement and all the preaching or selling side of things for them to really adopt this without feeling they have to put multiple hats and work more because that's what people is usually worry about. Oh no, I have to do three more things now and I don't want to do it. Amy, I'd love to get your thoughts on the importance of honesty in discussing challenges at conferences or panels. Oh, it's, it's, you know what, I, I speak a lot in, in conferences, panels, webinars, etc. And one of the things that I think is um, my, my um, signature is I'm honest. I'm going to tell you, that's, I told you, four or five months to find the right use case. I'm going to tell you that cats and unicorns and, you know, rainbows come all over and I just, in, in the right use case, fall down, you know, and just found that because that's not true. And and I heard a lot and I've been in a lot of talks and a lot of uh, panels where people is just like talking about how good it was the implementation, how easy it was and how big they are right now and this and this and that. And for me, I'm like, Really? I remember once I was in this uh, Google talk about data mesh in Zurich, and um, there was these people from Metro um, in Germany, and they implemented data mesh. And they supposedly had super good tracks and super good domains and everything. And I was next to a person uh, from another company. And the lady, I mean, she's really good at speaking, but she was just like selling it so easily that I was doubting about it, right? So I look at the other guy and the other guy look look at me and we were like, no, no, that cannot be that easy. And then we started to ask questions with the talk uh, finished you know, uncomfortable questions because what was the challenges? How did you do this? How did you do that? How did you overcame this and that? Do you have many problems? Oh, no, no, no. When I came there, it was everything like this already. And she was already like for three years. And this process was already like for six or seven years. So imagine how long it took to really get into where they are right now. But she was basically speaking in how they put it together. But, you know, it didn't really add up. So I heard that a lot in, in many conferences and talks and panels. And that really bothers me because when I go to one of those uh, talks is to learn from the struggle of the others. If you're reading media, if you're reading LinkedIn, a lot of people talk about the easy stuff. And I think that's quite unfair because people get more frustrated. If you are very junior, you're going to think, what am I doing wrong here? Do I suck? <laughs> you know, if, if, is it my problem? I'm not being able to really, uh, you know, things right here and it's not that it's just like um the importance to be honest and no bs you know in what you do it's to help the community to give back a little bit of what you have learned and the people will be able to learn from you and also you will be able to learn from the other mistakes so when you come to the next challenge you will learn from others or from even yourself so i'm very honest i always talk about the challenges and I think that should that how it should be in the industry. Unfortunately, you know, that's not uh, the case in most of the times. And I assume you also have seen that. As we wrap up today, could you share insights into building data products that aren't discussed enough in your view? Dashboards. And maybe only 30 or 40% were being used because someone just asked for one dashboard and then they were like, okay, I don't need it anymore. Or maybe I will check it once a year or something. So when I started like this uh, metrics library as well, where I asked, okay, why do you need this metric? How is the calculation? What is the value? Have you seen this calculated somewhere else? You know, it's like a questioner. People, as you said, it's the same with the mentorship. When they have to answer more questions and they don't get it just for free, you know, you need to do something to get it, they tend to back off. And and then you can create more valuable products that actually be used. And then you can reutilize in your library, you know, certain metrics for other products. So, um, for example, the data product, uh, the data uh, product value proposition will ask you, okay, what's the value of this? Why are you building this product? Um, what, uh, how often do you need it? I mean, 
to use because then maybe we can refer you to a different dashboard that will have the same metrics. So you don't need a uh, dashboard exactly for that, but you only need to check that part and then you can filter and use just the metrics that you need. Um, what are the risks? Have you Did you have this product build up before maybe on Excel or somewhere else? And then we assess this and then we find the right product for this person instead of creating many of them. And then we have the uh, data product canvas where all the technicalities of it, um, it's basically written, you know, like refresh rate and how often um, the data is going to be, um, you know, presented and how the, if you want a bar chart or pie, or pie chart, whatever you want, right, for example. Um, and this is something I have found that is quite a good solution to only focus on products that really matter. Otherwise, you're still getting a lot of requests. Hey, data team, I want this, I want that, do this, do that. And then, as I said, might not be even used or maybe used only once. And also to make the stakeholders to give you the right uh, requirements and not coming out of the data team, but coming from them. So you bring real value. And that's something I have learned over time, not only in data, but in software engineering, when I work. People tend to ask just for miracles to happen and not necessarily it will happen. When they realize, when they have to think what product they want, the requirements, why they need it, and what they need, they tend to bring real things that can be built and not only, you know, magic or um, book histories. <laughs> so by overcoming hurdles, organizations can transform challenges into steps towards success. So follow Amy on her professional platforms to stay updated on more insights, especially LinkedIn. And if you're eager to dive deeper into the world of data innovation, watch this previous clip I did with Madhuka Kumar on how data leaders use storytelling to drive action. I hope you enjoy it. And today's episode has been brought to you in partnership with our friends at Amplitude. And so from me, Ross Webb, until next time, bye for now.